You know how when you're at a party and people ask, what do you do? And you're expected to reply with what you do for a living. So we might say, I'm a writer, or I'm a teacher, or I'm a therapist. It's daft really, I know, it's a conversation starter. But why do we insist on these sort of labels as though we expect to be able to summarise a person by what they do? People say to me, oh, you're a dowser, as though that encompasses my whole being. Not only do I do many things other than dowsing, of course, but also there are so many different sorts of dowsing. And that's what we're going to look at today, the labels and what it means to be a dowser and what are the specialisms of dowsing. Hello there. Dowsing is just one of the ways on this channel that we try to consciously open up to intuition to create more peace, balance and harmony in our lives. The other techniques we use are meditation and mindfulness, which can give us a really good foundation for insight and co-creating in the everyday world. If that sounds like the sort of thing that you might like, click subscribe, click the grey bell icon to get notified every time we upload a video or do a live Q&A. My name's Tim Walter, and as we have to use these labels, I'm a house healer and an alternative life coach. I use dowsing as part of my house healing work, but I don't consider that dowsing defines my life. I probably do more dowsing than you do generally, but it's only a small part of your life, I expect, and it's only quite a small part of the house healing process that I do for people too. It's a very important part though, because it forms a framework for my intuitive connection to the management upstairs. It's them who provides information that we then work with to help the client to heal and readjust to life circumstances. And in this respect, the sort of dowsing that I do is often referred to as spiritual dowsing. I connect to the subtle realms through the personalities, beings, or uncover features that can be found there. Dowsing is certainly not clever or special, but it is a very personal thing. And while we can douse for almost anything, sometimes the ways of dowsing don't suit everybody. For example, I won't douse somebody's property for the best place to drill for water. I won't often douse to try to find a lost pet or a person. I'll give it a go, but my success rate isn't very good. I douse to ask upstairs about the well-being of people, to look for specific things that they want to show me that when adjusted will help improve the feeling of the space and the experience that my clients have to the place where they live or work. It's a specialization in itself, I guess. And so when I make videos about how to douse, I'm suggesting the most common ways that are usually taught to find dousing success. Each individual may well have different ways to learn for themselves, but no matter your route to accessing the information that is in the ether just beyond our five senses, the most important thing in all of this is to trust that we're being guided and to believe in what we're doing. Without these two aspects, which are admittedly unquantifiable, we will get nowhere in our dowsing. Like I say, all types of dowsing won't suit everyone, and for me, dowsing started as a way to communicate with spirits. In fact, it was to communicate with a particular disincarnate entity in our house, and that has always been the main reason that I douse. Others will douse for minerals, underground cables, archaeology, health issues, lost people or pets, or even use it as a way to do a version of remote viewing. And actually, that latter aspect, remote viewing, is probably the closest to the sort of dowsing that I do. But what I do can't be called remote viewing because I don't actually follow the recognised remote viewing protocol. So it's slightly different in that sense. And actually, I must just add, while we're talking about different sorts of dowsing and some aspects of dowsing is which is really interesting, which is finding hidden things underground. And some people are so good at it that they can locate skeletons of ex-kings under car parks in Leicestershire. If you don't know what I'm talking about, pop that into Google. So, being labelled a dowser is a little bit like being labelled as a writer. We can all write, we can all either pick up a pen or sit at a keyboard and write something, even if it's just a shopping list. A professional writer will have taken the time to study and practice and gain experience on how best to use his or her skill as a writer in an area of specialisation that they enjoy. So a writer might be a poet, 
a novelist, a journalist, a screenwriter, short story writer or a copywriter. There are all sorts of different genres of work that a writer can do and each of them has their own specialist structures, their own rules that the writer will have learnt to understand and to work within. And even more than that, there are specialisations within these headings for writers too. Take screenwriting. I used to do a little bit of screenwriting and was gobsmacked when I discovered that there were actually dialogue specialists. In other words, their expertise was simply in writing dialogue and that's what they did the most. They built their reputation as writers on creating sparkling dialogue that leapt off the page and transferred easily to the screen. Now that is really specialising. What I'm saying is that dowsing is a tool, like the writer using their favourite laptop or pen, and just like a writer, the skill is in what is found within the person, not in the tools themselves. In other words, the internal process a dowser goes through in order to find the information is the important part. It's not necessarily about what type of tool or the actual act of how to hold a rod or a pendulum that matters. Using the tool gives us the framework in which to have the inner experience, of course, the part of dowsing that matters. And that is why some people prefer one specialism to another, because they find they react differently to dowsing for different things. Now then, let's just finish with a clip, a little video clip, and a visit to a great respected dowser who was himself a specialist in dowsing for earth energy. This is my dear old mentor, of course. This is Hamish Miller. He wouldn't douse for water, and he says so much in this clip from a DVD we made together called Diverse Dowsing. We made it in 2009. I've shown it here on the channel before, but here he is again, Hamish Miller, talking about his particular skill of dowsing for earth energy and what happened when he wanted to drill a borehole on his land. The clip I'm going to show you is at the end of the DVD, so I'm going to let it run to the credits just for old time's sake, and hopefully you'll allow me to sort of wallow in that uh, rec reminiscing. And I'll see you here next time for some more about dowsing, mindfulness, and creating harmony in your world by seeking balance in all things. So here we are then. Here's Hamish Miller. My specialisation is in earth energy. I think the simplest possible way to talk about Earth energy is to say that it's the Earth's nervous system. And to understand that, you've got to understand that the Earth is a dynamic, changing, living, pulsing being. And it's, it's got every right to have a nervous system as, as we have. Every person has little subtle energy bodies around us, the biomagnetic fields. This is a, a, a geomagnetic field, if you like, which interacts with our biomagnetic fields and it has profound effects on our physical being. It's infinitely complex. It's four-dimensional, it could be six-dimensional, we don't know, and many people pick up parts of this thing which are certain kinds of grid on the Earth. I pick up energy lines which are part of its whole system, and they, they are dynamic. Where they curve and where they cross are very special places, very sacred places. Many of them were ancient sacred sites. Sacred sites, of course, were recognised by, by the old people, the Neolithic people, and uh, they were open, much more open to the subtle energies of the Earth, and when they, when they, they were nomadic and when they walked around they would find a place where they, they, they felt good and as soon as they stayed there they started to commune with the cosmos and that's their, their form of prayer. Their consciousness affected the earth and the earth responded and they could feel the response and we underestimate their knowledge and their, their, their ability to relate to the cosmos and the movements of the sun and the moon and the stars and, and things like that and they weren't diverted by all the things that, that we are diverted by. We really ought to know more about it because it has such a powerful effect on, on everything we do. The thing about dowsing that's not really understood is that everybody thinks it's, it's that dowsers can douse for everything. In fact, this is true to a certain extent, but it's like saying everybody can play the piano, and, and that's true to a certain extent. But dowsers, like surgeons, like all sorts of different people, specialise in different subjects. And in fact, recently, I, I, I uh, wanted to find some water on my, my land. And although I've been dowsing for 26 years, I got a specialist water dowser in because they are the people who really know how to do it. For this site, I think the yield would be around about somewhere between 
150 and 200 gallons an hour. It's more water than any domestic supply would. Die. It would it would run quite a lot of farm supplies. And then I got on to Aaron Bray, who has the drilling rig, the compressors, and all, all you need to put whacking great holes in the ground. We always douse the supply before we drill it. Geological surveys can only tell you so much. By water dowsing, you get a good choice. Some people believe you can drill anywhere, and they tell you that water on their land is not always the case. Um, you know, the odd thing, geology affects things sometimes. There's different factors that can affect things. Most of the time, you know, we're probably about 93% successful with, with dowsing. When the guys were put, put the, the first drill down, Ralph said it would be about 120 feet. Well, they started to get it about 110, and that is not bad. <laughs> it's not far out at all. So uh, I'm absolutely delighted. This is a really practical demonstration that dowsing works. This water is 125 feet down. How else can you know that there is water there? apart from by dowsing. You've got to be very open to these things and not um, block, block anything. Just let the feelings and everything flow. You can feel that pull and it does it despite you and that is a lovely thing when people realise it's not up to them. It's like opening a door and you look in and you think, oh, I don't know whether I want to go there. So you close the door again. And when you're ready, you'll open that door more and more and more. And you realise there's so much to learn. Once people start it, I think it catches hold of them and becomes very important. And it's fascinating. It's very exciting. It is a built-in human capability. And a privilege to do it. Mm -hmm.